I look at this and I'm scared. It looks as complex as OpenStack. So, yes, this is me. I'm Nigel Poulton. I love to talk about technology, okay? And I find that Twitter is a cracking place to talk about technology. So please, feel free to reach out to me and talk to me about tech on Twitter. It's great. I'm a co-host of This Little Beauty, all right? A weekly technical technology infrastructure podcast where we talk about all the best infrastructure tech news from the previous week. Highly recommend listening to it. And what an awesome logo. So there's like, <coughs> we've got beer mats, we've got stickers, the lot, pick one up, but listen to the podcast. Right, so I do like loads of things for work, but I mentioned this one here, plural site, because the topic of to uh, today's conversation is containers, and we're probably going to talk a bit about Docker, okay? On plural site, I've done some, I think, pretty amazing Docker courses. If you want to get up to speed on Docker, if you don't quite grok it yet, I recommend you pop over to Plural Site and check out my course. Big warning though, okay? I'm a bit of a technology fundamentalist. And I consume this stuff by the truckload. I've got the, I've got the track mark. Some of you probably know this already. So prepare yourselves, okay? Strap up. I'm going to deal out to you some good, clean container Kool-Aid. First off, though, let's have a story. Bear with me, okay? Let, let's step back in time a little bit. I'm thinking like 10 to 12 years ago, okay? At the time, I was a Windows administrator, and I loved my job. Racking and stacking servers, building operating systems, troubleshooting, honestly. Designing and deploying my first Active Directory. Oh. No, I'm deadly serious. It was like, this was good stuff. Now, at the time, I had a cracking lab like this. No kidding, right? It literally was, it wasn't those two compact PCs, but it was those models. And then I had, it wasn't exactly this monitor, because that's like the posh flat screen version, but you know the kind, right? A proper backbreaker if you ever had to move it. That was my lab. And it was in the days, right, where KVM didn't mean awesome hypervisor. KVM meant one of those switches for keyboards, videos, and mice. Great days, and I have fond memories of it, right? But the lab was a nightmare. It sucked. At the time, right, I, was, I think I was studying to upgrade my MCSE from NT4 to Windows 2000. And you want to try implementing like a real-world Active Directory replication topology when you can only build two servers, okay, and they're all on the same layer two broadcast domain, it sucks, okay? At this time in my life, I met VMware. And I don't want to get emotional, right? Wow. I, I, I kid you not, it was like, I don't know, 10 billion synaptic pathways in my head just lit up all at once. I had like 100% of my brain capacity available to me. I could see everything. It was like every IT problem, past, present, and future. And I could see the answer to it. It was awesome. Um, I was like Scarlett Johansson in Lucy, if you've seen the film. So I met VMware, and it was like, oh, yes. First thing I did right, I fixed that. And what happened? That. That's what my lab became. Didn't make me look like Tom Cruise, unfortunately. But my lab totally changed. I remember this experience with VMware vividly, right? At the time, though, you know what else I remember? I remember the, the IT decision-making conversations that were going on. Everybody was like, wow, this is amazing stuff. This is going to change the way that we do things. But... It's not for production. I mean, good grief, right? I built production systems that had paying customers on them. And as amazing as VMware was, everybody was in agreement. Oh, great. Keep your dirty mitts off our production kit, though. And I thought exactly the same. VMware back then was not for production. OK, let's fast forward to now, right? 
What a different world. How the enterprise has changed. Everybody's pretty much got a VM-first policy. I mean, to request a dedicated physical server, it's like a thing to be ashamed of. I mean, it's like it, there's a proper, have a, yeah, thou shalt not have a dedicated virtual machine. That's how important this stuff became for us as enterprises. I hear right that Pope Francis is about to canonize this as a commandment, okay? The only thing stopping them is you can't have 11 commandments in the Decalogue, right? So they're debating which one to get shot of. The word is, right, they're going to get rid of keeping the Sabbath day holy. We live in a 24 by 7 by 365 world, right? There's no more sleeping on a Sunday. So we're going to have a new commandment, okay? Remember the physical machine to keep it holy. Servers shalt thou build and deploy all thy workloads on. But the physical machine is holy. On it thou shalt never directly build an operating system. Not thou, not thy manservant, not thy maidservant, nor thy cloud provider that is contracted unto thee. All workloads shall go on virtual machines. It's just the way that it is, right? Now, VMware changed the game. <coughs> Where's Foskett? Oh, he is there. From crappy baseball to superior cricket, okay? <laughs> He's American. <laughs> VMware, it changed the game, right? But you know what? We resisted it at first, and I want us to keep that in our heads. It took time for us to get VMware in production, okay? Hands up anybody who wishes we were back in the, the physical world, right? Shush. <laughs> Nobody, right? Now then, this like awesome experience of 10 billion neural pathways lighting up all at once that I thought was a once in a lifetime experience, well, it happened again to me. Maybe like a year ago, when I came face to face with a big blue whale. I kid you not, okay? When I grokked Docker, it was VMware all over again. I was like 100% of my brain. I was like, I could see everything. I could see the big bang, the flood. I could like perceive space expanding in real time. I was like on fire. I understood my wife. It was an awesome experience. I knew that my world was going to change again, right? My little world of storage and a bit of virtualization and all that. I just knew it was going to change. I shouldn't have clicked the clicker yet. As amazing as it is, right, the conversations I'm having and I'm hearing are exactly the same as they were when we first came with virtualization and VMware. Great, okay? Awesome. Game changing. Keep your dirty mitts off my enterprise production apps, though. Yeah, all right. Net new, born in the cloud, hocus pocus, fine for that. Fine for labs, fine for development environments, okay? but thou shalt not use containers for my enterprise applications. These applications that we secretly despise anyway, right? Can I, can I get a show of hands, right? Anybody in the room that loves Oracle and that doesn't work for Oracle? I thought, right, for the video, nobody, nada, okay? Nobody loved the sheer simplicity of major upgrades or that lovable licensing that they've got. There must be somebody here who just wants to invite their Oracle sales team back home to meet the family for tea, but you're just a bit too embarrassed to ask, no? Of course not, right? We'd love nothing more than to show them the door. Okay, they're a necessary evil. They know that, but they know they've got us locked in, right? They've got us by the short and curlies, okay? It's not a good place to be in. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but this is evolution, OK? Just check. Yeah, OK. So it's history repeating itself. And what did we learn from last time around, right? Yes, with virtual machines, it took time to get them into production, OK? And yes, banks, pharma, insurance companies, they take a bit longer than everybody else, all right? but ignore containers at your peril, okay? I mean, think about the game today, okay? Enterprise IT is already at war with the public cloud. And I'm telling you, 
the public cloud is all over containers. And the benefits and efficiencies that the public cloud are going to reap from containers is going to just lump the squeeze on enterprise IT like never before. Honestly, ignore containers at your peril. I mean, and as well, right, please don't hide behind a corporate policy of no, no for the cloud -o. Because that's not going to last forever. It's going to change. There's nothing as consistent as change, right? And when that change happens, when our conservative enterprises that we work for are suddenly able to lump stuff into the cloud, enterprise IT better have a better story than it does now. We better be more efficient and more flexible than we are now. J just think about it, right? The, the brain power and the, the technical might that exists at AWS and Microsoft Azure I don't know, right? But, but it's my guess that it's not going to be long before the public cloud is considered more secure than on-prem stuff. And when that happens, we have got to be prepared, OK? That's the end of story time. Let's do a bit more work, OK? Why containers, then? But I think we all grok why virtual machines, but why containers? Bear with me on this. I'm not going to spend a massive amount of time on it, right? But effectively, containers... Uh, Hypervisor virtualization version two, okay? I would say that the container is to the hypervisor, what the hypervisor was to the physical machine. Um, they're leaner, they're meaner, they're more portable, all of that kind of jazz. They're like the X-Men of the IT world, right? We might not have containers in our organization right now, at least that we know of, but they're out there already, okay? Um, I'll, come to why, I'll come to why in a second, okay, uh, or, or where they are in a second, but just look at this diagram, right? We all understand it. Physical machine at the bottom with a hypervisor, okay? Let's say we're going to run 20 instances of Linux. So, for starters, that's 20 operating system installs, thank you very much. That means... 20 times however much CPU Linux wants to use, 20 times how much RAM, 20 times how much disk space. That's only the start. It's like 20 operating systems to install, maybe to license, definitely to patch. That's all operational overhead. And it's squeezing the efficiencies that we can potentially get if we go to containers. Click at work. OK. So the container model, we squeeze the operating system down to become the shared resource. And by doing that, we've only got one times the CPU, one times the physical RAM, and one times the storage space that Linux needs. And we've got one, app, one installation of Linux to install, potentially to license, and to patch. What enterprise doesn't want that, OK? It gives us efficiencies. It means that we, instead of 20, physical, uh, 20 virtual machines, each with an application, we can probably have 50 or 100 containers running, each with an app inside of them. That means less physical service to buy, less physical service to manage and to own. I mean, we all want that, right? But containers aren't new. They've actually been around for ages. So. While for the last 10 or so years in the enterprise, we've been trudging along with virtual machines. The guys that we secretly all want to be, Google and the likes, right? They've been rocking it with containers. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows it, but any time you fire up Gmail, Google Docs, any Google apps, you're firing up a container in the background. These guys have been rocking with it for years, and it is high time that the enterprise started taking advantage of containers. We all secretly want to be these guys anyway. Right. <laughs> if anybody's seen Hans's hairstyle, I don't know what the, which one's Ant or which one's Deck. Deck. Thank you, Chris. The thing is, right, one of the great things about virtual machines, and it's a two-edged sword, okay, is that it lets us just pick up our existing legacy. I mean enterprise applications and drop them into a virtual machine. We don't have to change them, and that's a good thing, right? No. Okay. What we end up with is like 1990s monolithic apps that we all hate, that we're all getting screwed over on licensing and support for, 
and we're still stuck with them. Who wants that? Well, something that I've not mentioned about containers yet, all right, is that to get like the true benefit of containers, we probably need to start rethinking and refactoring our applications. Or if it's too much work for us to refactor them, at least get rid of the nasty old monolithic crap and replace it with something that was designed for today's infrastructures, so cloud and containers, and to tackle today's problems. And also today's like IT consumption models and things as well. So containers kind of force our hand in a way that virtual machines didn't to rethink our applications. So to think about things like microservice-based applications, where we build an application now out of like loads and loads of tiny little processes and services, each one independently pluggable, independently upgradable, without having to take the monolithic application down. I mean, there was no show of hands when we asked, who loves Oracle and their like awesome major upgrades and stuff. But we all know those weekends where it's, oh dear, it's time to upgrade Oracle Financials this coming weekend. Everybody wants to take the weekend off. Nobody wants the overtime. You can potentially, with a bit of effort, right, escape from that old world. Containers allow us to do that. Now then, I didn't press the button, Enrico, to tell me how much time I've got left, so I've no idea. You just throw, throw something at me. Okay, so... Let me talk about a few things that are coming in the container world that I think are really, I don't know, good stuff for the enterprise, right? First up, there's choice and competition. So we've got Docker. Everybody probably has heard of Docker, but we've got Rocket as well from the guys from CoreOS. Now, Docker, it's got the momentum and it's got this awesome ecosystem springing up around it. And despite being only like two years old, it's actually a pretty compelling platform to develop on at the moment. Rocket, a little bit newer to the game, but potentially able to learn from some of the early things in Docker. It's less of a platform, okay, and more of just a container runtime, but it's got security at the core. But for me, right, competition and choice is just so important. It drives innovation, right? We already have competition in the container ecosystem. Right, okay. So... Um, clustering and orchestration and stuff like that. It's dead easy to spin up like a really simple application and run it on containers, okay? But scale is a challenge. I mean, scale's a challenge at everything, right? But it's still a challenge with containers. Fortunately, though, things like Docker Swarm, Docker Compose, and then if you want to go bigger scale, Mesosphere, Kubernetes, all of these kind of things are coming along to help us as enterprises orchestrate container infrastructures and applications and large-scale applications across big container infrastructures. And then somebody like Tutum at the bottom, they're aiming for this ability to be able to take our workloads as enterprises and run them anywhere. Now, that might be a little bit scary at the moment, right? But five, ten years' time, I mean, if you wind the clock back five or ten years ago to the physical world, and you look at where we are now with virtualization, it's like a world of difference, okay? Well, wind the clock forward five or ten years, it's going to be even more different, right? So, Tutum, the ability to take a workload and throw it up into AWS and then shift it over to Azure and then over to Joint and back down to on-prem, I mean, that would be awesome in the future, right? Five minutes, okay? So there's like this amazing breed of nano servers coming out right now, okay? And I'm talking here about proper, proper server operating systems, not a desktop operating system that we kind of fudge into the data center as a server. These are like properly refactored for server workloads. So they're 64-bit only. There's no GUI. They're tiny, so they've got like a tiny attack surface. There's hardly anything needs patching. They barely ever need rebooting. They've got different management paradigms. I mean, CoreOS are one of the early ones there, but then Red Hat have got Project Atomic. Ubuntu has its snappy core. <coughs> Rancher OS is an interesting one. But everybody's a buzz at the moment because Microsoft are getting in on this now with Nano Server. And then, like yesterday or the day before, VMware announced Project Photon. So it's not just like the scary, innovative, cool startup companies that are doing these operating systems now. It's the old guard from the enterprise as well. Microsoft and VMware, the guys that we trust, they see the writing on the wall. These 
these nano server operating systems right. They're not written for traditional Oracle apps and Microsoft Exchange and stuff like that. I mean, maybe those apps will adjust to run on them, but these are designed for containers from the ground up and for the cloud as well. Hyper-V containers are potentially interesting for the cautious enterprise. I mean, information sketchy at the moment, but potentially, you know, Microsoft, they grok the enterprise, okay? Maybe it's one for a conversation afterwards, but Hyper-V containers look potentially interesting. A couple of final things, right? The storage industry is starting to grok containers as well. Old-fashioned storage, eh? Who would have thunk? Um, check out, like, Coho Data and SpringPath and people. They're doing cool things with containers. And you can almost bet your life right that Docker and everybody else is also talking to these storage-related companies and saying, how can we offload some of the, the, the storage functionality and, and magic to your services? A little bit, little bit like VAAI for uh, virtual machines. Bear with me on this one, okay? This is nothing short of sheer scandalous. Un I can't back it up. It's speculation, all right? But I would not be surprised if before long we see container-based offloads for, uh, from chip manufacturers like Intel and AMD. Things like Intel VTX and the likes, okay? Speculation, I can't say. Right, look at this image really quick, okay? What do you see? Shed loads of containers, okay? But what about these? Gantries, um, cranes, this is a rail terminal down here. I don't know what all these are, like some kind of forklift trucks. There's loads of containers on there, but there's a shed load of infrastructure that runs them. What's inside of the container, right, probably belongs to the developer. But all of the infrastructure and the magic that makes it work needs to belong in traditional enterprises to operations. Please, okay, don't get caught out and let the developers just have Docker spring up everywhere and you don't have control over it. You need to get your hands on it. You need to grok it personally and your enterprise needs to as well. Otherwise, you'll have container sprawl and you won't be able to rein it in. Now, to help you rein it in, to help you grok Docker, <laughs> and for you to help your enterprises, right? Guess what? I've got some Docker courses available on Pluralsight. And how's about this for an advert for it, right? Naught to 60 on Docker in five and a half hours. Sounds slow, right? But no, honestly, if you think containers are interesting and you want to try and get your head around them, go check out my Pluralsight course. It's a subscription-based service, right? But they always have like at least a 10-day free trial. Go on there, watch it. If you stick around and pay them in the end, fine. If you don't, I'm not bothered, right? You've got your company and yourself and your own career, right? Up to speed for the next generation of technology. The end. Yeah. All right. Questions? Oh, yeah. Nigel? Does anybody have any questions? I have no answers. And like I said, I'm a fundamentalist. <laughs> and if you've ever spoken to a fundamentalist, you know what kind of answers you get. But does anybody have any questions except the front row that I've been spitting on? Yes, Julian. Do you see any issues with um, containers uh, in terms of a security boundary or a performance boundary as well? Because people are saying with, with VMs you can control yes. performance and security, with con containers not the security, but what about performance? Just dumping a million containers on a physical box. Oh, well, yeah, obviously you have to be careful, but potentially containers give you better performance than virtual machines because there's not the overhead. Generally speaking, when people have done tests, you get very, very close to bare metal speeds with containers. If you overload the server, of course, you're going to have problems, but that's the same with virtual machines, right? Um, and containers fighting each other for performance? Yeah, potentially that can be a problem as well. Yeah, you need to be careful with that. Just like... So anyway, there isn't a difference with that compared to virtual machines. You're just removing an abstraction layer... And ultimately, apps are going to need to be written, and they're going to be scalable across multiple physical machines anyway. Yes, yeah. Security, I do think, because I don't want to skirt this topic, is potentially a concern as well, um, which is why Hyper-V containers might be worth a discussion later on outside. Um, but I do think that the guys at Docker and certainly Rocket and places, they get security, right? And, and changes are happening. Let's not forget, right, the container... Well, the Docker world and the Rocket world are no more than two years old, okay? We didn't get to where we are now with virtualization overnight. 
So yeah, security is probably lagging a little bit behind. But if you've got like a proper enterprise layered security model, probably going to be all right. I don't know if that helps. Yes. Don't you think that Linux is actually the changing agent that oh, made containers right. widely available? I mean, they exist in Solaris since 2003. Yes. And nobody ever talked about them. Yeah. And I think that, don't you believe that Linux was the fact that made wide adoption of Yes. So, so I, think, I think Linux is what's changing the world, OK? Um, the answer to everything is not 42. It happens to be the Linux kernel, okay? But I, I, think, I think what happened with Docker, right, and why Docker is working now versus Solaris zones, which potentially may be a superior, okay, especially from a security perspective. I don't want to get into a religious war, but it's all about timing, okay? We're all starting to adopt cloud. The Internet's ubiquitous, right? Linux is just rocking the world, okay? I mean, Google were the guys that got all the magic for containers into the Linux kernel years ago. We're, we're just, it's the right technology at the right time, it feels at the moment, so. It's about timing, yeah. Yes, it is about timing. Can I sit down? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. What's your vision for uh, storage in, uh, in a, let's say, Docker on the enterprise? <sighs> yeah, that's a really difficult question. What I would say is, go and take a look at SpringPath and Coho Data, okay? I'm not suggesting that either of those companies are going to be a success, but I think they give you a hint of the kind of things that are to come. Um, so spinning up containers on storage arrays to do storage-related functions like dedupe and thin provisioning and maybe encryption and stuff like that. Uh, and maybe not just those traditional things, but like log analysts an analytics and things like that. Spin up a container very close to the storage on the actual hardware, and I, I think that's at least one of the things that's going to come. I wouldn't be surprised if Docker and folks are also talking to storage companies. I think I hinted at it and saying, uh, is there any way that we can leverage um, storage technologies to take some of the load off uh, the container hosts and things?